Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Where the Dark Corners Are. Travels hostess. So tonight is a special episode, and it is in honor of my favorite non holiday holiday, Halloween. Ha 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 ha. And there is no better topic in my Dark Travels hostess opinion than to discuss the one, if not the main, Halloween character of them all, Count Dracula. Ha 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 ha. I don't know why I always want to do that, but I do. Anyways, and what a better time to discuss the places associated with the legendary Count Dracula. Now, we all know that Count Dracula was based very loosely on a real-life man named Vlad the Impaler. But minus the location of Transylvania and their association with blood, these two entities are absolutely nothing alike. So, tonight... Let's talk about the man, Vlad the Impaler, versus the legend of Dracula. Let's start with the man, Vlad the Impaler, first. Now, Vlad, say that ten times without stuttering, Vlad the Impaler was actually Vlad the Third, the son of Vlad the Second. Now, Vlad the Second gets inducted into the knightly order the Order of the Dragon in 1431 by the King of Hungary. The King of Hungary actually will become the Holy Roman Emperor. So basically, Vlad and his father are Christians. In fact, they're serious Christians. They're enrolled in the Holy Order of the Dragon. And because of this induction for Vlad II, he earns the nickname Dracul. Dracul in ancient Romanian means dragon. So naturally, Vlad III is called son of Dracul, or in old Romania, Dracula. Dracula. Now, in modern Romania, um, you know, a couple hundred years down the road, when Bram Stoker is researching someone to base his future head character on, he comes across the modern word of Dracul referring to the devil. So in ancient Romania, it means dragon. In modern Romania, it means the devil. Now, again, being Christian, which Vlad II was, and being part of the Order of the Dragon, Daddy Vlad's job is to defeat the Turkish or the Ottoman Empire. Because Romania literally stands between Christian Europe and the Muslim Ottoman Empire and the Turks, the Turkish. So he's got a, a big job to do. And when he dies, Vlad III, Vlad the Impaler, basically picks up where Daddy leaves off and does his best to fend off the invading Turks and the Ottoman Empire while trying to wheel and deal with the greedy Christian Western countries, namely uh, Germany and the Saxons of Germany. The Saxons in Germany, obviously, maybe at some point in time had been related to the Saxons of Britain, but we're just talking strictly the Saxons of Germany. And after trying to be diplomatic with these guys and paying the Sultan you know, a fee to keep them off his back and nobody's really listening and everyone's just doing their own damn thing, Vlad finally decides that perhaps to show a force would be a better approach to show them that, hey, I'm not fucking around. So during his three different reigns, because he, he actually reigns three separate times in his lifetime, it is believed in totality he kills somewhere between 
forty to a hundred thousand European civilians. Civilians, of course, being political rivals, criminals, and anyone he basically considers useless to humanity by, you guessed it, impaling. And as for the Ottoman Turks, you know, with his fighting with them, he uses the same technique of impaling, and it is believed he paled about up to 100,000 Turks as well. So he literally earns this nickname of Vlad the Impaler. And yes, by impaling, we're talking a very sharp stick stuck through the, their bum, all the way through their body, out probably their mouths or neck or some part of their head, and their decaying bodies perched for everyone to see and basically leave that image of, don't fuck with me, I'm going to do this to you. So he is really uh, dark and... The Germans, of course, deplore the fact that he has done this and puts him in a horrific light, completely, of course, ignoring the fact that they kind of pushed him into this corner. But it doesn't matter. He's given this image. This is the image we currently have, historically speaking. And because of his contributions and because of this time, he is actually associated with some pretty definite and must stops for any dark travels in Romania. So let's talk about Vlad, the Impaler, and more importantly, let's talk about his first wife, along with the Paneri Castle. Now, not much is known about his first wife, but it, supposedly uh, she and Vlad would truly love each other, and when he went on campaigns, especially against the Ottoman Empire, he truly trusted her to rule in his place. Together, they were residing in the fortress called Paneri Castle. This castle was built in the early part of the 13th century, and it's near Chavasti, which is on a cliff above the Argus River Valley in Wallachia, which is the name of the region of the area of Transylvania during his time. Now, while he they were living there, Again, he was waging a war with the Ottomans and the Turks, and so they invaded Transylvania and attacked this fortress that they're resigning in. Well, Vlad ups and bails on his wife. He escapes unharmed, leaving her behind. And she, instead of being taken alive, she jumps to her death in the Argies River below. And legend has it that the river ran red with her blood, and it has now been given the nickname the Ladies' River. Since then, many have claimed that Vlad's wife continues to roam what is now the ruins, because it's literally 700 years later, and many believe that her apparition has been seen multiple times within the castle. And because we're talking medieval times, medieval fortresses, she's actually not alone. So... This particular uh, castle, the ruins rather, not only have her, but the ghosts of those who've been enslaved there or were killed in order to build the fortress have also been rumored to haunt the area. Many people have spotted these ghosts not only in the castle, but also in the surrounding valley. In addition to uh, the ghosts of the wife and the ghosts of those who were enslaved and or killed there, there are also frequent reports of visitors claiming to see unexplainable light anomalies such as floating orbs and flashing lights in the valley. And some of these strange lights will actually quickly ascend to the castle up a hill using a path that currently isn't there but perhaps existed in their heyday. So it's like the ghosts are returning home to the castle. And some people actually believe that Vlad himself also haunts the area because it's his stronghold. He created this place. He lived there and supposedly lived there with someone he truly loved but bailed on, so I don't know. But the coolest thing ever is that you can actually visit the Paneri Castle, but you absolutely have to have to plan your visit ahead of time. Now, to access the castle, like I said, you, you do absolutely have to plan because they only grant access or entrance, rather, twice a day, once at 10 a.m. and again once at 3 p.m. And you absolutely cannot be late for these. So if you're planning to go, 
you have to be there at these two given times. And once you meet the staff at the small gates, which is located near the souvenir shop to the castle, you will have to ascend 1,480 stairs to reach the top. And only at that top, once you've committed, there you pay the admission fee. The admission fee is cash only. They don't have, you know, the square up at the top of the hill. So obviously bring money. In my research, I was not actually able to locate how much the admission fee was, but I'm sure at the souvenir shop, they will tell you. Anywho, now like I said, he escapes like a son of a bitch leaving his wife behind. He eventually gets captured and he gets imprisoned at Castle Coven for 12 years while his brother Radu the Handsome is given the crown, his younger brother. And there seems to be conflicting information. There's information that suggests that during this 12 year imprisonment, it was harsh, it was cruel, and his thoughts turned to evilness. But it's kind of hard to believe that because during this 12 years, of his imprisonment, he actually meets a woman, he marries her, and they have two children. So, I mean, I don't know if it's the combination of the two or what, but his brother actually ends up dying from syphilis because, I guess, being too handsome and getting busy with the dirty ladies, he dies from a venereal disease, and Vlad is given back his crown, but he does come out with kind of a, a vengeance. Again, he goes after those who are trying to invade Transylvania because he's Christian. He's trying to keep the Turkish and, and the Ottoman Empire off his back and out of his kingdom. And so he you know, starts another war with them. And again, unfortunately, he, he eventually gets taken at a battle against the Turks near the town of Bucharest in December of 1476. And... This time, the Turks, they aren't playing. They aren't messing around. They're like, we're done fighting with you. And they behead him. And they behead him near a place called the Witch's Pond, located in the Buda Caressa Forest near Bucharest. It is believed that this place is filled with sorcery. It is not a popular site for the locals. So the locals actually avoid the pond. And many believe the pond waters itself is cursed. And part of the reason why they believe it's cursed is because witches from all over the world have gathered here to perform their rituals there. The pond is rumored to contain a great energy that causes any spells to be cast near it to be cast successfully. And this is why the site is popular, again, um, amongst the witches, but also like the Wiccans. And they even come to this pond to visit on secret celebration days, including the Zanzanelli celebration, what happens in June. So here, this very powerful and evil guy is beheaded by this place. And the place itself is a little sketchy, even for the locals. But, I mean, there are reasons why. In fact, one of the things that is very curious about this place is this pond, it never dries. It never expands, and neither rain nor drought affects its shape in any way. So it never changes. And even the animals dislike this place so much that they don't even go there to drink water from it. And and if you, t- if you look at the pictures, there is actually this really strange algae that layers the pond. So it's creepy. It's odd in its own nature. Animals avoid it like the plague. The locals avoid it like the plague. And to top it all off, there are actual some strange mysteries, legends, and tales of ghosts surrounding it, including including Vlad himself. They believe that Vlad haunts this area as there has been numerous reports of people who have seen his apparition wandering this particular section of the forest. But he's not the only one. There's been a a lot of unexplainable, phenomenal experiences in the vicinity of the Witch's Pond. Despite these chilling factors, it is also a beautiful and serene place surrounded by a dense forest. Again, it's not that far from Bucharest, 
and it is easily accessible by a car. The problem, though, is is that there's no parking near the entrance of the path to the pond, and it is off a busy highway. So if you choose to check it out, which, I mean, let's be honest, it sounds really kind of cool, the safest way to, to, to get there is to be dropped off at the path's entrance and then, the, you know, the driver take off. And I understand that it is a short walk from the road, but the pond itself is unmistakable and easy to spot. Now, this is not the final resting place or believed to have been the final resting place of Vlad the Impaler. Okay, they beheaded him here, but they actually believe that Vlad was taken to a monastery on an island of Lake Snagoff, which is about 30 kilometers north of Bucharest, and they believe that he's actually buried there. However, in the 1930s, there was an excavation done at the site, and it failed to actually turn up his body. So... I don't know. I mean, he was pretty important ruler. And even though, historically speaking, he has this horrible name, you have to remember to the people of Romania who he was trying to protect his kingdom, he was trying to keep all of these invaders out, he's considered a hero. So maybe he was buried at one point in time at Snaganoff, but maybe they decided it would be best to protect him and preserve his legacy by hiding him somewhere else. So who knows where the church may have hidden him because, again, you have to remember he was actually a Christian and he was defending his homeland. Now, Vlad, his Dracul name, and all of his impalingness, if you will, obviously catches the attention of Bram Stoker, the Irish gentleman who will write Dracula and publishes the, the novel of Dracula in 1897. And an interesting side note, Bram Stoker actually never enters Romania. He he does all this research from afar. So he's learning about the evils of Vlad the Impaler. He's learning his name of Dracul and is now associated with the devil. So he's gathering all these information as best he can for his book. And he's just kind of taking a stab at it. But, I mean, he does a very good job because he actually brings the legend not only alive, but Romania and Transylvania will actually kind of cater to this. And more importantly, it does lure a lot of people, a lot of visitors, a lot of believers in the Dracula legend to this area. So let's talk about the legend of Dracula. The story itself of Dracula, it follows the story of the lawyer of Jonathan Harker. Jonathan travels to Transylvania to broker property purchases made by Count Dracula in London, England. Count Dracula, as we all know, is a centuries-old vampire sorcerer and your basic Transylvanian nobleman. Very shortly after his arrival, Jonathan learns all these things about his client, and he basically fights with Dracula. Dracula being the badass that he is, he wins, But instead of killing Jonathan, he leaves Jonathan trapped in his castle while Dracula takes 50 of his coffins of Transylvania dirt to London, England, where Dracula begins to attack innocent children. Now, long story short, Jonathan escapes the castle, returns to England, and with the help of Dr. Van Helsing, they push Dracula back to Transylvania and they kill him in his own castle. So... As you can see, basically, minus the location, because we all know location, 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 and the name connection, there really is not much connecting these two imposing men of, you know, Vlad and Count Dracula. Having said that, again, Transylvania definitely has some historic and haunting places that you can visit that are actually associated with the travels of Jonathan Harker and Dracula as well. So let's talk about the travels of Jonathan Harker and obviously the places associated with Dracula uh, that are all, of course, all in Transylvania. In the novel Dracula, Jonathan visits the town of Vistrista and stays at a place called the Golden Crown Hotel. Believe it or not, you can actually visit this 
hotel, currently receiving 3.5 stars on my Bestie TripAdvisor, you can stay for yourself and or you can just, if you're just hungry, you can visit the Jonathan Harker Saloon, which is located on the ground floor, and you can enjoy the special Jonathan Harker menu. So you can spend the night there. You can eat there, totally up to you, but the place does exist, and it is in the town of Vistrista. Again, being familiar with the storyline, in the Bargo Pass, there is the Dracula Castle Hotel. Built in the 1980s, it is complete with a crypt and a coffin in the basement, and it is deliberately built near the spot where Harker meets Count Dracula's carriage at midnight for the final leg of his trip to Dracula's castle. Dracula Castle Hotel itself is currently receiving 3.5 stars on my bestie, TripAdvisor. And I did actually take a minute to look at the hotel, pictures of it. And it is what I really actually kind of like about it. It's cool. It's kind of like park hotel, park castle looking. But it's inside. It is. It does look like it's distinctive to its native culture of Romania, which I do appreciate. Because, I mean, we are, part of the purpose of traveling is to enjoy, obviously, the culture of the locals and the natives of where, where you're at. And, of course, I would totally be remiss if I didn't mention the most important stop of your Dracula travels, which would be considered Dracula's castle. But there, the actual castle does not exist, but people associate what is the closest to the castle, as described by Stoker, as Bran Castle. Bran was built early in the 14th century as a medieval fortress, and it proudly resides on a hilltop near Brazov in central Romania, which actually fits the description of Stoker's pure imagination of what Dracula's castle looked like. But it is actually a real castle, and in its heyday, it was the favorite residence of Romania's Queen Marie. Queen Marie, she restores it and loves it so much that she actually uses it as a residential home for the royal family. And it's because of her, it has its beautiful rustic decor, its whitewashed towers, and its picturesque courtyards. I mean, Queen Marie, who is also the granddaughter of England Queen Victoria, she made sure that this castle was a proper royal family residence. And she did so by adding you know, the exquisite furniture, the statues, the paintings, the ceramics, and you know the silverware. Now, over time, as Romania changes, uh, as the country changes, it goes from you know, a, a ruling monarchy to communism to its current state. This particular castle actually, of course, changes hands. Open to the public in 1993, this castle is actually a museum that honors both Queen Marie, the woman that did all of this work to it, and the legend of Dracula. And let's be honest, I mean, that's pretty badass, given the fact that, again, Stoker never even set foot in Transylvania, much less Romania, and yet he's got a museum that represents and emulates one of his main characters. For the castle itself, it does have its own series of undead. By undead, I mean ghosts. Obviously, it should come to no surprise to anybody, but the most prominent ghost seen is actually Queen Marie. She loved this place. She spent so much time making it a home for her entire family. So it goes without saying that there have been many reports of her apparitions being spotted, not only within the castle, but its surrounding gardens. Queen Marie apparently loved walking the gardens and taking her tea in the gardens. So basically, it's as if she never left. Aside from her, there are other accounts of shadow figures, disembodied voices, a few possessions, unexplainable orbs of light, and even some poltergeist activity. In fact, the activity is so prevalent at Bran Castle that it's not only a hotspot of ghost hunters, but it is also your general hotspot for paranormal investigators. And, and, and there's a good reason, because they're actually catching... EVPs, they're seeing the shadow figures and they're having these exceptionally par paranormal experiences. And why not? We're talking about a castle that has been around since 1311. So basically 700 years 
and in its history, we're talking, it's got the brutal medieval times history, and, you know, who knows what, what went on in the dungeon. So, of course, they have a slew of ghost activities here. And, interestingly enough, one of the most haunted areas within the castle itself is a once-hidden staircase that connects the first and fourth floor of the castle. And why not? If it's hidden, kept away, and who knows what... Who got killed there? All in the name of you know, political vengeance or in the name of the queen? Uh, without a doubt, that doesn't surprise me. So obviously all this information that I have, I researched. I googled, I poked in this website, I looked at this article, I read this piece. And during all of this research, I actually had the idea of contacting Braun Castle directly and asking for further information. And Braun Castle answered back. So, first of all, shout out to Alex for <laughs> responding to my email. Alex at Braun Castle in Transylvania, Romania, guys. Um, but he explains in his email that during the last 10 years, they have hosted several paranormal investigations conducted by teams from the United Kingdom and the United States. And he explains that some of these teams have reported paranormal activities in the castle's gunpowder tower, in the old dungeon, like I said, and on the inner corridor at the second floor. So that's totally awesome. Thank you again, Braun Castle, for adding that additional awesome information. I truly, truly appreciate it. Now, in addition to all of this and the connection of the bloodthirsty Transylvania nobleman, Stoker actually learns the villages near Bran actually have a belief in the existence of a certain living type of people called the Strogi. The Strogi is a group of people who basically lead a normal life during the day, but at night during the sleep, these certain groups of people have the ability to leave their physical bodies with their soul and haunt the local villages and torment people. So basically, when they leave their souls, they become these evil little spirits that haunt and prey from midnight until sunrise when they no longer have any power and then they basically return to their physical bodies to and wake up. And then they're like, they're perfectly fine. But the idea of their undead entity coming from d alive people is you know gives way not only to vampirism but the the premise itself of someone being able to leave their physical body in their sleep should actually sound a little familiar to all of us if you like horror films or familiar with scary movies because that idea is part of the premise of the movie Insidious. The little boy astroplaning, leaving his body, he gets stuck, can't come back, daddy needs to go get him. But, I mean, isn't it totally awesome that these scary notions and these evil little creature concepts are still very much alive in our modern day world? Either way, I I'm digressing. But getting back to good old Dracula and Vlad, there is actually no real record of... Vlad actually ever visiting Bran Castle, but obviously as the prince and ruler of Transylvania, Vlad knew of his existence because it was positioned there to protect, again, the invasions of the Turks. So he knows it, but there's actually no association or even record of Vlad ever even being at Bran Castle. But none of that matters because on the premise and the legend of Dracula, it attracts at least a half a million tourists every year. And, good news, you can visit. That's right. As part of the whole Dracula, Transylvania, plotting and planning our dark tours travels, it, this castle is actually open every day. Unlike the other castle where you got to be there promptly at 10 and promptly at 3. And during the high season, which is April 1st through September 30th, it's open Monday from 12 to 6, Tuesday through Sunday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., 
And the latest submission is at 9 p.m. During the low season, which obviously is during winter, the colder months, from October 1st to March 31st. Monday, it's open from 12 p.m. to 4. Tuesday, from 9 a.m. to 4. And last submission, of course, being 4 p.m. Admission is standard tickets, 9 euro for adults, 7 euro for seniors, 5 euro for students, 2 for children, and... They do offer a reduction or free admission for the disabled or children under seven. And people who are 65 and older, if they show their identity card, they get them for free, which is very interesting because we'll talk about that in a slight second. But you can also add on some extra options. You can check out the medieval torture instrument section for two extra euros, and you can do the time tunnel which I'm not really sure what that is, but that could potentially be that secret staircase between the fourth and the first floor for an additional four euro. Now, tickets purchased on the spot are only valid for the day of issue, or, of course, you can always purchase online in, in advance, which I do highly recommend. To get to the town, you have to walk through the town's market, and then once you reach it, it's a bit of a slope of a hike, and then you have your additional 1,408 cobblestone stair steps to reach the top. So it kind of cracks me up a little bit that they offer a senior discount for 65 and older. I don't think they'll make that 1,408 cobblestone steps, I'll tell you that. But if they can, and they do, will color me impressed. But remember, it's perched on top of a hilltop, just like Brian described it. So... I'm, <laughs> I I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> Moving on though, and but one last Dracula fan fun stop I did do actually want to mention. This one's actually not associated with the novel Dracula, but it is. It seems like it would be a fun fan stop if you are in Bucharest. There's a place called the Count Dracula Club. It is a restaurant with rooms reflecting both the macabre themes and the folk customs of Transylvania. And yes, the Count, that sly old devil himself, likes to mingle with the guests, possibly looking for his next Nina. Anywho, before I close out tonight's episode of The Man vs. The Legend, I wanted to share probably the top five things I bet you did not actually know about Dracula. Number one, Bram Stoker's original title for Dracula was The Undead. Number two, Count Dracula's original name was going to be Count Vampire. Number three, despite most vampires in popular culture being able to be killed via a stake through the heart, Dracula himself, and then, you know, write this down in case you do need him. Dracula himself must be decapitated first and then impaled. It's got to be in that order. Decapitated and then impaled. All right. Number four. In Stoker's book, sunlight does not bother Dracula. Boom. Biggest, biggest bomb I've got for you right there. <laughs> sunlight doesn't even phase Dracula. All right. Final and fifth thing you probably didn't know about Dracula, there have been over 200 Dracula film roles. 200. And 11 of those, which is basically a good percentage, 11 of those roles have all starred Christopher Lee in the role of the Count himself. Okay, so that's it, my fellow Dark Travelers. That is all I have for tonight, but before I go, I should like to remind you all of the giveaway I'm hosting in the previous episode of Penn, Poe, and Philly. We talked about Edgar Allan Poe and the game Murder and the Rue Morgue Mystery Memory. To enter this giveaway, simply send me an email at wherethedarkcornersare at gmail.com with the year that Poe published his literary piece, Murders in the Rug Morgue. That's it. You know, hello, my name is Dina. And he published it in XXXX. And here's my address in case I win. Have a lovely night. <laughs> 
and hit the send button. It's that simple. But getting back to this podcast, if you have a place that you would someday like to see where their dark corners are or have a specific tourist attraction in mind, then send me an email at where the dark corners are at gmail.com. So until next time, please remember only the few can find the beauty in the darkness, which is why I hope to meet you where the dark corners are. Mm-hmm.